Another Republican running for president visits the Texas border and then talks with us. I need to introduce myself to the country. How will Miami Mayor Francis Suarez break through in a crowded field? And what does he think about razor wire, a floating barricade, and busing migrants to other states? A Texas superintendent wants lawmakers to know districts are struggling to find enough money to meet new security mandates. We need the money. Wiley ISD's David Vinson is with us this morning. Are Texas Democrats destined to stay in the minority for decades? One state rep who first served in the 1970s says it does not have to be this way. We have a candid conversation with John Bryant about his party's future. Inside Texas Politics with Jason Whiteley starts now. Hello, everybody. I'm Teresa Woodard in this morning for Jason Whiteley. We are glad you're with us. Let's begin, as always, with some political headlines from all across the state. We are beginning with relief, finally, for Texas homeowners. It's in the way in the form of property tax cuts. An event in New Caney, which is northeast of Houston, drew a bipartisan crowd of lawmakers touting the package they passed after two special sessions. They're sending about $12.5 billion to school districts to cut tax rates. That's called compression. They're also raising the homestead exemption from $40,000 to $100,000. Now, this does require a constitutional amendment to take effect. Only voters can approve changing the Constitution. So you are going to see this issue on the November ballot. Governor Greg Abbott also celebrated the signing of Senate Bill 15 last week. This is a bill that keeps transgender athletes off college teams that don't correspond to their gender at birth. The signing at the Texas Women's Hall of Fame on the TWU campus was only ceremonial because Abbott officially signed this bill in June. The event still drew protesters though. The state already has a ban like this for K through 12 sports. This new legislation does take effect on September 1st. Now let's head down to Houston. According to a recent poll of likely city voters, the election for mayor in Houston is really just a two person race. It's between State Senator John Whitmire and Congresswoman Sheila Jackson Lee. The survey by the Hobby School of Public Affairs at the University of Houston shows Whitmire with 34% and Jackson Lee with 32%. Six other candidates are polling in low single digits. This mayoral election is November 7th. So the Texas border seems to have become a mandatory stop on the campaign trail for Republican presidential candidates. Is it just a photo op or does a visit actually lead to real policy proposals? Miami Mayor Francis Suarez is the latest contender to travel to the border and we spoke with him from McAllen. Mr. Mayor, good morning and welcome to Texas. Good morning. It's great to be here with you. In a recent editorial, I read that you wrote, you'll have more to share on what you believe immigration policy should be after visiting the border. You're there. So what would be the number one thing that you would do to try to fix what most people will agree is a broken system? The number one thing is uh, after, of course, fixing the border, which I came to a section of the wall where you could see the difference between the former administration's policy and the current administration's policy. I mean, the Delta just in the size of the wall. Uh, was different in confronting the crisis. But I think where, where, where my policies are different is in taking the half a trillion dollars that we are sending to China, bringing it, nearshoring it to our hemisphere that creates commerce and prosperity so that you depressurize uh, people from wanting to come uh, to the United States. They're coming because of the desperation and lack of opportunity. We wanna make sure that they have opportunities in their own communities so that they can be prosperous. Let's talk about some of the measures that are in place and see if you support them. Do you support the floating barricade and razor wire that's currently in the Rio Grande? You know, I didn't get a chance to see it, uh, but I, I did get feedback uh, on it. Uh, and, you know, I, what I was told is that they're trying to implement it in a humanitarian way. You know, I think both sides have to have to try to do their best to avoid uh, a tragic situation. As a mayor, how do you feel about the policy of busing migrants to other cities that are led by Democratic mayors? I understand why people do it. They're trying to send a message. It obviously doesn't solve the problem. Uh, I'm into solving problems uh, as, as a public official. Uh, I don't like blaming other people. I like uh, creating a policy that will solve the problem. And I think uh, as the what would hopefully be the first Hispanic Republican president, I'm going to have an opportunity to lead on this issue 
prioritize it. It's an issue that has affected my family. My family are first generation immigrants to this country. They came at 12 and seven, exiled from their country of birth, Cuba. Uh, and, and as a Hispanic, I can also tell people in their language that they need to try to come to this country in an orderly and legal fashion. You are currently running against some people with some very big personalities. How do you break through in a field that includes Donald Trump and Ron DeSantis? Um, I think Republicans are looking for someone else. Um, you're seeing that um, the governor is declining in the polls. I saw a poll today where he was actually in third place. Um, and you're seeing sort of a reshuffling. So I think what's important for me, who's relatively unknown, is to introduce myself to the country, make it to the debate stage on August 23rd, and start the process of educating the country on who I am, on why electing someone like me is important for the future of the country, someone with my record, someone with my background, and someone who can connect with the people that I can connect with to create generational wins for Republicans. Do you believe you can make it to that debate stage? I do, and we feel good about it. Um, and I think it's essential for my candidacy for me to be there. I need to introduce myself to the country like I have introduced myself to Iowa, which is why we met the Iowa polling threshold. And so I think it's important uh, to take that limited amount of time where you're close to on an equal footing with other candidates to be able to tell your story as quickly as possible, uh, you know, talk about your background and talk about your vision for the future of the country. That is what has to be the roadmap for people to choose their president. Well, there's a couple of weeks to go to do it. Mr. Mayor, we appreciate your time this morning. Thanks so much. Thank you for the time. Congressman Colin Allred and State Senator Roland Gutierrez are touting different skill sets in their campaigns to unseat Senator Ted Cruz. Allred is playing up bipartisan credentials and Gutierrez is touting his willingness to stand up to Republican leaders. Let's bring in Ian Meacher from the Texas Tribune now. All right, Ian, what do you think? Which strategy is going to succeed in 2024? Well, certainly, I think, you know, both of these candidates are going to, like, make the case of, like, look, while looking at focusing on Ted Cruz more than each other and how they're the best candidate to do that. And you're also looking at a 2024 campaign, like, also with Cruz, right, who's a very, you know, very strong campaigner and stuff. And so they're going to be thinking about that. But also, you'll, you're will you going to be looking at the top of the ballot with the presidential election. So there's going to be a very, you know, tumultuous kind of campaign here going on. So, you know, whether Allred can, you know, emphasize his ability to work on Capitol Hill with others and Gutierrez, you know, He's, he's got a very strong, uh, you know, especially with representing Uvalde and the shooting victims, uh, his his work there, too. I think, you know, some of that combativeness is really going to come out and, you know, it's going to be a combative election no matter what. So we'll see what happens. Yeah, lots to watch for in the coming months. All right, let's talk about this absolutely relentless Texas heat. And when it comes to farmers, there's some reporting in the Texas Tribune about regenerative agriculture. I want to learn what that is. And then is that going to work to conserve water and really keep soil healthy? Well, it's 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 a response, and and you know several hundred farms, and particularly in the high plains, uh, are are doing this regenerative farming, which is all about soil health and protecting you know soil by covering it, whether through mulch or crop cover. The idea is like it doesn't dry up as much in the heat. Uh, hopefully, you re requiring less watering and stuff. And so you know it's 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 early on in the process for a lot of farmers, but some are seeing um, progress here, and it's it's going to be necessary if we continue to see summers like this. So it's it's a, it's early in its infancy, but people are seeing progress out there. Interesting. All right. Ian, thank you so much. Stick around. We'll see you again in just a few minutes. Up next, a plea for Texas lawmakers to fully fund the mandates they pass. A suburban school superintendent says educating kids costs more than ever. How much more money he needs from the state. Plus, a Texas Democrat who says his party is getting things all wrong. Inside Texas Politics will be right back. Texas school superintendents are stressed out. A semester is beginning with several new demands from the state, but little new funding to pay for them. At the top of the list is House Bill 3, which requires every campus have someone armed with a gun. David Vinson is the superintendent of Wiley ISD, a fast growing suburban district in southern Collin County, which is northeast of Dallas. It serves more than 18,000 students. Dr. Vincent, thank you so much for giving us a few moments during what I know is an incredibly busy time for families and superintendents all across Texas. Um, Thanks for I having me, Jason. Absolutely. I recently saw a quote from you where you said you were glad that the Texas legislature is taking school security seriously, but serious also means fully funding it. How much more money would you have liked to have had from the state in order to meet the requirements of HB3? Well, when you look at it, 
the minimum is at least $250,000 more to fully fund the 14 officers that we've had to put at the campuses. And those are annual costs that will be in perpetuity. Glad to have them. And they're super going to be we welcome. Um, actually, our agreement with, with our, our security firm has been just great, but we need that money. You just mentioned LMP, the security firm that you are contracting with. Uh, how comfortable are you that these are going to be contractors? And if you had been fully funded, would you have preferred to have hired officers as full-time employees? It depends on the case where we're talking about the campuses. So with the high schools or the junior highs, it's a lot more dynamic. There's a lot more different things that happen and those kind of things. When we talk to our law enforcement folks, they're having a hard time filling their regular positions. And so when we're going to be doing that, it's a great partnership to ebb and flow. It's like, what can you do? Obviously, we love our partnership with Wiley and with Saxe. Even with the Sheriff's Department in Collin County, great relationship. Have a self, have, you know, the Sheriff Skinner's cell phone number. But, you know, they simply, it's hard for them to fill 14 more jobs. Mm -hmm expect a special session at some point this fall. The governor has said it's going to happen and it would probably tackle teacher pay raises, which were not funded during the regular session, as well as school vouchers. Is it difficult to begin a school year with uncertainty around a budget and also around the future of vouchers? I was driving to school at 545 this morning and the song came on, it's tricky. And I'm telling you, it's tricky making all of this stuff work this year. We've had to, we had, it wasn't just teachers. We had to put $1.3 million in to school bus drivers because the economy and inflation and all those kind of things, finding people to do their jobs was one thing. And then we had special education mandate, $3.1 million in addition to our regular budget for meeting special ed compliance stuff. We give a 3% raise and our teachers deserved every bit of it. And we're having to say no a lot more than we used to as far as it goes. And we're we're one of the lucky ones. I mean, a lot of school districts in our, in our region are, are adopting deficit budgets. How often are you in touch with the lawmakers? How much are you saying to them, we need more funding? And do you feel like you're being heard? Well, you know, Justin Holland has been a real champion uh, for us as far as all of those kind of things go and, and has talked a lot to us. You know, our, our communications with our other folks, have, it's there. I mean, I seriously have, a, you know, a great relationship with the folks, but it's just we're, we're, we're sort of at this, this, this impasse. When the voucher thing comes up and you're going to get five or six thousand dollars just to do whatever and go wherever with none of those requirements, you know, we're going to have to work that out. And we're going to have to work through this this process of saying, how does that all work? You know, it's 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 going to be a challenge. And um, I, I'm looking for those answers, uh, you know, and it's been the most challenging of legislative sessions that I've ever ever. Well, and what you do every day is a challenge. So best of luck as you begin a new school year. Thank you for what you do. And thank you for giving us some of your time. Thanks. Now, a candid conversation with a Texas Democrat who says his colleagues in the state house are doing things the wrong way. State Representative John Bryant first served in the 1970s, back when Democrats were in the majority. He is now serving again during a time when his party has a firm hold on the minority. Bryant is from Dallas. He represents parts of North Dallas and East Dallas, and he spoke with Jason Whiteley at a bar and grill in North Texas. You know, one reason I wanted to talk to you because you've been critical of Democrats today, uh, suggested that Texas Democrats are fine with getting the scraps left over uh, in, in, in the legislature. Uh, I think you even called them a bunch of sheep in an interview with Texas Monthly recently. <laughs> Were, was, are those correct quotes that I'm reading? Well, I was talking about the state Senate when I call them sheep because okay. uh, of the, the fact that they follow along with, obsequiously without ever fighting back. Um, but uh, I, I have been, I am a Democrat, of course, and I'm a deeply committed Democrat, but I've, our Democrats have been in the minority in the legislature for 20 years, and the governorship has been in the hands of the Republicans for almost 30 years. 
So being in the minority for that length of time, I, I think they have developed a lot of bad habits, which are to try to go along to get along, try to get by with a smile and a shoe shine, hoping their personalities can keep them below the radar screen and maybe pass a bill here or pass a bill there. But the combination of all these bills that they pass that way don't amount to uh, anything as bad as the way in which we lose on the major issues, the appropriations bill in which uh, governs how we spend the money, the tax bill which governs how we tax people, and most importantly, public education. What, what kind of reaction have you gotten from your fellow Democrats this go around? Uh, a positive reaction. Have you really? Most acknowledge that this is, the, is true. Not sure, they're not sure how to get out of it. Remember, the vast majority of the 64 Democrats have never known what it's like to be in the majority after 20 years. There's only a handful of us that know what it's like to be in the majority. And I think a lot of our guys have lost their muscle memory of what it means to really be in control and to be, be governing the state. Uh, I don't like being in the minority. I've been in the majority before, and I'm pushing to get us back in the majority. What, what's the long-term strategy of today's Texas Democratic Party? Well, I can't speak for the state party as an entity. I can speak for what uh, I believe we should be doing in the, in the Texas that? House. And that is you've got to take the fight to the Republicans when you have the votes to do it. When they have to pass a constitutional amendment and need 100 votes and we have 64, we need to say to them, we're not going to pass it unless it contains our priorities also instead of laying down and letting them pass these things uh, because you don't want to make anybody mad. And that's what's been happening, and it happened numerous times in this last session. No one in the legislature ever criticizes the governor. Only a handful of us are willing to do that, or the lieutenant governor. They're afraid their little bill will be vetoed, so they stay quiet all the time. Uh, they don't want to be accused of being partisan. Well, you just have to put up with those accusations. You've got to say something. Bryant explains how he thinks Texas Democrats can regain that majority in the legislature in a new episode of Yolitix. Be sure to download it this weekend wherever you get your podcasts. New motions filed in the Texas Attorney General's impeachment have some wondering if a showdown is going to happen before the trial even begins. We'll talk about that on the roundtable next and discuss whether high speed rail has actually been revived in Texas. It is time now for Reporters Roundtable. We have Ian Mitra with us again from the Texas Tribune. We're also joined every week by Bud Kennedy from the Fort Worth Star-Telegram and Bernadine Steptoe, the political producer from WFAA TV in Dallas. Great to see all of you. We appreciate your time this morning. I want to start by talking about sort of the news that is top of mind for a lot of people as we're getting closer to September, and that's the impeachment trial of Ken Paxton. So many motions have been filed already, Ian, including many that are trying to dismiss all of the articles. What's going to happen? Is this going to be a showdown before the actual evidence even begins to be presented? Yeah, that's right. The latest round from Paxson's legal team was uh, a motion to dismiss all 20 articles of impeachment, you know, really citing that they're saying that they're baseless and unsupported primarily and uh, also are just, uh, you know, aspects of the attorney general doing his own job. So, you know, certainly this is going to be the, the House managers will have a chance to respond here in the next few days. You know, at the beginning of this, the, the senators, this, you know, I keep hearing Bernadine's voice. This is a political trial and there are 16 <laughs> uh, votes required to to overturn a dis to overturn a, an article. And there's 19 Republicans. That's just something to keep in mind as as they kind of get down to it. Bud, what do you think? Are any of the articles going to actually be dismissed? Well, you know, this is one of the points where it really does matter that Angela Paxton won't vote. You know, there was a lot of talk about how it didn't matter that she wouldn't vote on the two-thirds to remove him, but it does matter that she isn't part of the simple majority. You know, they, can, they have to have 16 votes, uh, and Angela can't be one of those 16 to discard one of the articles, so it, it does matter. Uh, they probably will be able to get 16 for some of the articles of impeachment, Maybe not all of the articles. They probably will be able to get 16 for some of them, hmm. at least a few. Uh, but the question is, I, I just don't see that they can get the 22 to remove. Bernadine, do you think this removes any of the burden off of senators? Uh, if they just dismiss an article, then they don't actually have to take a vote on it? Absolutely. But I think that I agree with what uh, Bud just said, that I don't think they're going to get the opportunity to dismiss all of them. 
And if they don't dismiss all of the charges, then the trial will go on. And as you remember early on, Lieutenant Governor Dan Patrick said that he thinks that a trial should happen because they need to move past the charges that are uh, uh, that are behind Patrick and just I mean uh, Paxton and just continues. So I don't think they're going to get all of them dismissed, perhaps a few, but not all of them. Well, we shall see. September 5th, it begins. All right. I was really surprised this week, y'all, when I learned that Amtrak is now joining the fight to try to revive high-speed rail in Texas. My husband and I joke because he used to be a reporter and we both used to cover this issue like 25 years ago and it still hasn't happened. So, Ian, what's happening? Is, is high-speed rail actually a p possibility? Well, certainly with the addition of Amtrak as a potential partner in this and looking at this collaboration with Texas Central, it's, it, it grows again as a possibility. I mean, some of the same concerns that have been brought up in the past for this project still exist. You know, there's still issues related to, for, uh, relayed by property owners about the impact on their property. And, you know, there's still concerns about, you know, whether there's potential subsidies, even with this being a privately financed uh, project, mm -hmm. whether there could eventually be public subsidies required. Yeah. But quickly, what do you think? Is it going to happen? That's exactly the point. It's going to take a federal subsidy. The, the yeah. uh, Am Amtrak support is one thing, but it takes federal money to get it done and to run over the Waxahachie and Palestine and Hempstead politicians in between. Absolutely. Bernadine, final thoughts? Well, they have to get past the politicians. But remember, <laughs> in politics, there's never a never. So we'll see, but I doubt it seriously. Well, 25 years and it hasn't happened, but you're right. I never say never, especially in the state of Texas. Bernadine, Bud, Ian, we appreciate your insight. Always good to see you guys. Thank you so much for watching, everybody. And if you're headed back to school, hope you have a wonderful school semester. Take care.